make sure the red light's on right here. This interview is with Edward James Hayes in Dallas, Texas on March the 1st, 1996. The interview is being done by Vernon L. Williams with the Department of History uh, of Abilene Christian University. Mr. Hayes, if you would uh, give us a little bit of background, your family, where you grew up, and who your parents were, and uh, we'd like to know a little bit about uh, your life as uh, in the 1920s and 30s preceding World War II. Right. I was uh, born in Alvin, Texas in 1921, October, and uh, I lived in Sweeney, Texas for the first nine years of my life. At that time, in 1930, my father died, and I went to Illinois to live with my mother's family. And I grew up essentially in Illinois. I lived there for 12 years. Uh, my, mo my mother, of course, was from Illinois, and she came to Texas and met my father <laughs> in about 1920. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, father was from Texas, and uh, he was uh, in an oil operation at that time in 1920. Uh, after he died, however, and we went to Illinois, I lived on a farm most of my time in Illinois and learned to uh, husk corn and things like that. <laughs> uh, my mother, of course, was left with two boys, my, me and my brother. Uh, she had to work. She was determined to put us through high school, which she did. And. Uh, we didn't have time for the things that you hear youths doing now because we had to make a living and <laughs> we had to stay busy. Uh, I attended high school in Illinois and after I graduated from high school I wanted to go to college. I didn't have the money so I had to go to work. I got a job with Gulf Oil Company as a draftsman and I worked for a year with them before I went to the army. Uh, when about that time uh, things were getting pretty hot in the war and we, I saw that there was no way I was going to avoid the army so I decided to enlist and uh, my uh, supervisor at the oil company where I worked uh, asked me how I stood with the draft and I said well I'd made a preliminary registration but I hadn't heard from him yet. Well he said I suggest you go find out what, where you stood. So I went down to the draft office and they told me I was 1A and I was scheduled to leave in two weeks. <laughs> so I proceeded to enlist <laughs> and get it over with. Well, before we get to that, uh, give me the names of your mother and father first. Uh, my mother's name was Mary Sue Alfred. My father was James Graver Hayes. And what kind of work did your mother do raising these two boys? Well, my mother, of course, was relatively uneducated, and she did work in a sewing room. That's how she earned our living until my brother and I, at about age 13, where we got to where we could go outside and get jobs and go to work. Uh, my father was a carpenter and a plumber and an electrician. He did all kinds of things. And he was working at the Southern Pacific Railroad shops when my mother married him. But he later gave up that job and went to work as a carpenter in Sweeney and uh, has also worked as a plumber and electrician. Uh, uh, my mother, of course, did work in the sewing rooms under the WPA. At that time, you know, under Roosevelt, he organized the WPA where people worked for uh, their money they got from welfare it wasn't welfare actually because they worked to earn it. Uh, and she worked for $44 a month. And my brother and I worked in, um, he worked in a warehouse. I worked in, in uh, Piggly Wiggly grocery store as a clerk. And I would work uh, after school until closing time on weekdays, which was about 9 o'clock. And then on Saturday, I worked from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. In, in a grocery store. 
in the summertime we caddied at the country club. And we made pretty good money doing that. By the time I got out of high school, I had actually saved money and was planning on going to college, but I found out I didn't have enough. Uh, I have to say that my mother was certainly a trooper in her performance in seeing that Charles and I got through school. We certainly had the opportunity to be hoods. We grew up in a wide open town in Mattoon, Illinois. And uh, uh, every other door was a saloon practically with bookmakers and the whole nine yards. <laughs> Uh, but we didn't, because she kept a tight rein on us. And furthermore, taught us how to behave. Uh, at that time, that, that brought us to about 1942 when I got in the Army. And I remember we went to... Uh, Oh, that base in uh, Lockford, Illinois. Uh, can't think of the name of it right now. I am going to have trouble with memory here. Well, that's fine. Because of my, that's fine. Uh, I can't think of the name of it. It's a large, oh, Camp Grant. Camp Grant, a large induction center. And we put together a train load of young GIs that were shipped to uh, Camp Camel, Kentucky a whole train load of, of uh, enlistees. We even got a different serial number because we were enlistees instead of draftees. And, uh, and I was in the, the 12th Armored Division at that time. I went into the 12th Armored Division immediately. Uh, before we get to that, uh, I'd like to just uh, pick up a couple of things before we get to your enlistment. Uh, your brother said his name was Charles? Yes. What happened to him? Did he well, serve in the he war? He went to the Air Force, and he was drafted about six or eight months after I was. And my brother was overseas when I was. He was in the 12th Tactical Air Force, and his unit supported the 12th Armored Division. We tried to get together on every time. and We would have to travel some distance by Jeep, you know, because we were stationed in different towns. But we never quite made it, never quite got together. We almost did, but didn't quite. My brother was a, a clerk, and he went to the Air Force School in Denver to learn clerical work and stuff like that. And he was actually a squadron clerk while he was in the Army. Uh, he came out, and he became an accountant. And he worked his life until he died a couple years ago. He uh, worked as an accountant. A, a private accountant. What about your mother in the post-war years? What happened to her? Well, she lived uh, with my brother most of the time. I, I uh, came to Texas in 1947. My brother stayed in Illinois and lived and died there. Uh, so she stayed with them when she got to where she couldn't live by herself. And my brother essentially took care of her uh, until she died. She was in a nursing home about, uh, I think, about three or four months before she died. And she died of hardening of the arteries. When was that? Uh, uh, 1963, when my mother died. Tell us a little bit about uh, the, arrange the arrangements you made to enlist and uh, how, did, how did you go about doing that? Well. I had taken ROTC in high school, so I was determined I should join the infantry. <laughs> and, and I went everywhere pounding on desks, so to speak, to uh, find my way to enlist in the infantry. And they said, no, you just enlist in the Army, and you'll be assigned uh, when you get inducted into the Army. So I took that for what it was worth. and, and uh, of course, went by that. And when I got in the Army, I still tried to apply for the Air Force, and I mean the infantry, and couldn't get in. And then I tried the Air Force and couldn't get in. This was at Camp Shanks. 
But you understand, I didn't know anything about the ways of the Army. So I really didn't know what I was doing. Now, was that Camp Shanks or Camp Grant? It was Camp Grant. I'm sorry, Camp Shanks in New York, Camp Grant. Uh, so I, I didn't get anywhere in, in that attempt, so I just waited to find out where I ended up. And after a week at Camp Grant, they put us on this train and headed south. We well, didn't tell us where we were going. And they wouldn't tell us anything, Just we just headed south. And we ended up in, in uh, Camp Camel, Kentucky. You remember anything about that trip on the way? Oh, yes. Friendships or, or whatever? Uh, well, not a great lot of people uh, as far as getting close because we didn't have the time. It was only a couple of days. This whole, this whole period transpired in about a week or less. So we didn't have time to uh, form any close, long-lasting relationships. Uh, I do remember one incident, though. They had this train commander. He was a, a, a captain in the Army that had apparently come out of retirement. He was an old man, and he was just taking these troops by train to where they were supposed to be delivered. And I remember some guy uh, called him an obscene name, and he, he heard it. He wasn't supposed to hear it, but he did. And he went down the car trying to question to find out who made the statement. Nobody knew, of course. <laughs> but he'd have got the guy in trouble if he told him. But that was a, a kind of a comedy incident. But it only took, I believe, the trip was total of two days, something like two days from uh, uh, Camp Grant to uh, Camp Campbell, Kentucky. What, what occurred on your arrival at Camp Campbell? What did you encounter there? Uh, well, I, I don't, my memory is a little bit hazy about that. I know that I went directly into the division head, well, it was the headquarters division artillery, but at the end it was about 10 people, 10 or 12 people. It was kind of a platoon. And we hadn't formed a battery yet. But we were assigned to the 495th Field Artillery for training purposes. And we trained for the better part of two years. It was almost two years before we went overseas. So we did have relatively extensive training. How long did you stay with the 495th for training purposes? Well, like I say, I was just attached to them for training. And this was while I was in uh, of Camp Camel, and uh, the division, the battery was formed after we came to Camp Barkley. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but I was about a year in Camp Campbell and almost a year at Camp Barkley. Uh, but when we had uh, gone to the technical schools that we needed to be training. I was sent to radio operator school. I knew absolutely nothing about operating a radio, and I failed the aptitude test six straight times. So they made me a radio operator. <laughs> uh, my, my ambition, uh, later developed of course, was to be in the uh, operations department of a field artillery headquarters battery where I could learn to fire battalions and stuff like that. I studied it avidly. I read all the manuals on all the guns while I was in the Army, and I read the surveyor's manual on all the stuff that is related to uh, S-3 operations. But they still insisted that I be a radio operator. I understand this, the reason why there was a shortage of them, radio operators at that time. And they were trying to pick everybody that could qualify or if they, whether they could qualify or not to make a radio operator out of them. Uh, this consisted primarily of learning to copy the International Morse Code. And this was a, a thing that I flunked out badly. Yet, apparently that test wasn't valid because I did well in the radio school and I came out uh, copying 15 words a minute and uh, about a f three or four months after that, I passed a 20-word-a-minute test on International Morse Code. So uh, apparently that aptitude test was not a qualified test <laughs> like it was supposed to be. 
uh, I also took gunnery school, went to artillery gunnery. That's, I love that. That's what, they had a little mock-up, a little screen wire mock-up of, of terrain. And they had this little smoke pipe, a quarter inch copper tube that they could extend and puff up smoke at different places. And we were supposed to sight the field glasses on that and spot the round and make corrections and fire the battalion on that. And that was, you know, a training board, kind of a training board that we used at that time. And later, I, of course, umpired uh, uh, artillery firing. When we got new officers in the battalion, we had the, the colonel would take them out and teach them firing practice. And I was on the umpire team to score the rounds where they went. Can you remember any of those men in the uh, division artillery with you in your battery? Uh, co the, the commanders' names, uh, any oh, of the, uh, oh, any of your buddies in the battery? Could you tell us a little about about yes. any of them? Uh, my uh, commander at that time was Colonel Luberman, and the, uh, the command, uh, artillery exec was a lieutenant, Colonel Wyman. Uh, the uh, commander of uh, f uh, I mean, the 495th Field Artillery Battalion was Major Barr. He was made later Colonel, he was Colonel Barr, Lieutenant Colonel Barr. And, uh, we had a Colonel Hartman who was commander of the uh, 493rd Field Artillery, uh, I believe it was 493rd, yes. And uh, Colonel Wyman eventually became commander of the 494th. Uh, about that time, uh, this was at Camp Barkley. I got acquainted with Eugene Vitale, which was my buddy during the entire war. He and I roomed together, did everything together during the war. Uh, we had our sergeant major uh, on the 495th. I, I can picture how he looks, but I can't recall his name right now. Our sergeant major with for the headquarters battery once it was formed was uh, Sergeant Guion. Uh, we had a, let's see, Lieutenant, I can't think of his name. Lieutenant Croker was one of our training officers in the 495th. He taught us hand-to-hand -hand combat, stuff like that. He was a graduate of Yale, I remember that. Because <laughs> he'd taken some of that stuff at Yale University. Uh, Tell us a little bit about Vitaly. What kind of a person was well, he? Where did he work? Gene was quite an adventurer. When he was 15 years old, he decided to run off from home and join the Spanish loyalists in the Spanish Civil War. You remember reading about that, no doubt. It took place in about 1937, I think, somewhere along there, 38. And the police picked him up in New York and brought him back home. <laughs> He, he never quite made it. <laughs> and he was a guy that was, all during the war, the Russians were his heroes. And he thought Commander Zhukov, the commander-in-chief of the Russian army, was quite the cat's meow, so to speak. Uh, he was also in favor of communism, and he tried to preach communism everywhere. You have to understand that in the text that we were. I'd never heard of it in my life. I didn't know what he was talking about at the time. And I said, yeah, it sounds okay with me. <laughs> uh, but he was more wise to the ways of the world. And he had absorbed some of that propaganda. He was a few years older than I, as I remember, one or two years. He was older and experienced more than years. Uh, but Gene was an expert at small arms also. He was uh, very good uh, at handling weapons and small arms. He uh, excelled in that area. 
and he became a, 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 a buck sergeant on small arms. Uh, he was in, in a different uh, battery, though. And I, he was in the 493rd for a while, but he lit, later did come into the uh, Devarty. But I knew him from then, and so we were always running around together. Uh, we did New York together, <laughs> and the nightclubs and all. When we got in, we were in Camp Shanks, New York, and we spent a week there, and we had nothing but time on our hands. So every afternoon about 4.30, we would head for the city and uh, visit nightclubs. The people of New York were just outstanding in, in their treatment of GIs at that time. Uh, they wouldn't let us buy our dinner or anything else. And always somebody at a, a nightclub we'd walk into, some person would meet us at the door and escort us and, and we'd go, sit at his table. We even got to meet the, the performer at the Monkey Bar that way. I understand that nightclub is still open. Uh, we also visit the Latin Quarter, and I understand it's still open. And the Morocco, El Morocco nightclub, it's still open in New York. Uh, the people of Chicago were very good to us, but we were in there such a short time. We didn't have time to get acquainted with anything. Uh, Uh, let's see, I'm now to where let's, let's Vitaly back. and I, we went to overseas. Let's back up and talk a little bit about the training before we get to overseas. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, your time at uh, Camp Campbell before the uh, division went to Camp Barkley, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the kind of training that you actually did with the uh, 495th? Yes. Uh, of course, we got the training on the uh, cannoneer professions of, of a artillery squad. Uh, we got training in intelligence and training in hand-to-hand -hand combat and of course all the weapons. I qualified expert in all the weapons up through the 40 millimeter cannon, 37 millimeter cannon. And this, of course, included the 30 caliber machine guns, 50 caliber, the rifle and carbine and all that stuff, uh, and the bazooka. We had, of course, learned to fire the bazooka. And we had in that, we went to a Hellcat camp, so-called. And it was, seems to me like it was either two weeks or a month's duration where we went out and lived in tents in the woods. And we took training there of all kinds, including the medical training. We had to learn to give shots and all that kind of stuff. Uh, set bones, those things like broken arms and stuff. Uh, first aid generally. We. Uh, now that wasn't uh, the Tennessee maneuvers, was it? Oh no, that, this was that's just quite training. separate. Yeah, this training, and we uh, went on. 25 mile marches, they'd wake us up in the middle of the night, like midnight. And we'd get out and full, fall out in full pack. And we'd head out in the woods for a 25 mile march. And at that time, I was a pretty good walker, so that didn't bother me much. <laughs> a lot of guys didn't like it, of course, but it was necessary training. Uh, we, uh, later went on maneuvers in Tennessee. And I suppose that could be said to be our main effort of maneuvers that lasted two or three months. And we had a, a very simulated combat conditions. And we actually got a, a person killed out on maneuvers that I recall in our outfit. Um, we got tanks and everything stuck in the mud and had to learn to get them out and all that kind of things. By that time, I was more or less permanently switched to a radio operator. 
and I was operating a radio uh, on maneuvers. Uh, we rode in a half track, and had uh, and my my half track had uh, uh, two radios, an FM and an AM radio, SCR 506, SCR 508. The 508 was the uh, uh, FM, and it had two receivers on it. And the uh, 506 was called a command radio. I was in the command radio net, and it was for a more long, long range communication. It was normally good up to 100 miles uh, in distance, whereas the, the FMs were from ground to ground were only good for about 20 miles at most. Uh, So in the case of maneuvers, I can't report much that happened because I was closed up in a half track most of the time. Uh, after I came back from maneuvers, that's when I qualified to pass the 20 word per minute test for the International Morse Code. Uh, do you remember the circumstances surrounding the loss of that man that was killed on maneuvers? No, I, I just heard about it. I never knew about it firsthand, so I, I can't say it. I understand he got run over by a tank, but I can't be sure what what really happened. How long were you? Uh, how long was the division at Campbell after you got back from Tennessee before they uh, moved well, well, to Barkley? Well, see, well, we never left for. Uh, I mean, Camp Camel actually. We just went on maneuvers and then come back to Camel. And there, I, my memory is quite fuzzy on that. It wasn't very long, I know, before we loaded up on a train and went to Barclay. But uh, because that last couple of months, we were in the field constantly. We lived, you know, like under complete combat conditions. And we would actually, I remember one time we actually got a battalion lost out in the woods. That had to be a pretty extensive maneuver area to do that. You know, a battalion has about 900 to 1,000 men, and it's pretty hard to lose something like that. But we actually got one lost one time. I remember trying to locate him through the radio signal. I trust you found them. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, But again, I'm a little bit shy on uh, remembering the actual times involved. I know that we spent most of our first nine months or so there training. And then uh, two or three months, something like that, on, on maneuvers, maybe two months. And then a short time after that, we had to pack our gear and send it to Camp Barkley. What do you remember about Clarksville, about, Clarksville and Hopkinsville. Yes, what yes. What do you remember about that? Uh, I never went to town very often, but uh, to me, they were just a couple of small towns. I've been through both towns since then, you know. But uh, at that time, they didn't seem like very large towns to me, and there just didn't seem to be a lot there. My memory was uh, overcrowding of troops. You know, there were so many troops in the area. Uh, so I never got acquainted with any people at all there. Uh, we were pretty much restricted to the post most of the time. And the two or three months that we were on maneuvers, we were out of everything there. We didn't get off for anything there. So I only had nine months. Well, the first three months we were restricted anyway because of our training. Our boot training, that's why we got it there at Camp Camel. Uh, on up through the advanced training for our uh, military trade that we were supposed to follow. Uh, so I, I can't say that I remember very much about those towns from that time. What about men who had wives uh with them at Camp Campbell. Do you remember anything about the arrangements? No, I, I don't. I, I didn't know anything about that. Uh, I, I know there were a few that did have. 
but I never, you know, got into that in any way. Of course, I had no reason. All the people that I associate with were very young men, and we were single. <laughs> what about General Brewer? What do you remember about him? Uh, yes, I, uh, I remember Carlos Brewer. He was a, a commander, as I remember him, a real stickler for procedures. I know that. And the main thing I remember about him, he got in sort of a contest with uh, Colonel Millis. Now, this was at Barclay. Mm -hmm. uh, Colonel Millis, because the general wanted Colonel Millis to train uh, tankers to fire indirect fire. In other words, to fire them as artillery pieces. And he contended he wasn't given enough time and uh, the general thought he had. But anyway, he tried, and when they, they didn't qualify, that put Colonel Millis in a very bad light. So he got fired, <laughs> and he got, in other words, transferred to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I remember at the time I was working in the headquarters. This is at Barclay. I was working there as a design draftsman in the headquarters to design obstacle courses and that sort of thing. Uh, I remember the uh, colonel telling us, he came through the office and said goodbye to all of us that were there. And he said, I'm going to leave, but there's some people going to go with me. And they're higher up. And after that, I noted that uh, General Brewer was transferred also up to Fort Sill. So Brewer went to Fort Sill as well? Yes. I didn't know that. And he was uh, demoted back to a colonel. I've heard rumors that uh, this all stemmed, uh, Brewer's demotion, all stemmed from some kind of rivalry with a former West Point classmate. Had you heard anything about that? Yes, but I never got into details. I hadn't heard that, but that's just word of mouth only. I'd never seen anything hard or uh, not any detail at all. Did you ever run into Brewer again in combat? He was with the 7th Army, I believe. No, I, we, we never did, but I know of. Uh, of course, I wouldn't have known that at the time, by the time we got overseas. I probably wouldn't have known it, you know, if we had it. Anything else you can remember about uh, Camp Campbell before we move on to Barclay okay. that might be significant? Well, if you're talking about Army significant, I don't think I can say much, except I will say one thing, that our training, I felt, was very thorough, considering the day and time and the hurry up that we were under to get there. I say they did a very good job training us. Well, that certainly was my impression. What do you remember about the day that uh, you were told you were moving out for Texas? Do you remember anything? Well, uh, I don't remember a single thing. I, I suspect that we weren't told, but I don't remember anything about it. What about the trip? All I know was we were heading south again. <laughs> and we heard, you know, on the train, we knew where we were going before we got there. But I get rumors heard. The rumor must have spread on, on the train. What kind of uh, arrangements were did you enjoy on the train? In other words, could you describe the way that was laid out? Uh, what kind of cars you had? Uh, what about meals, stopovers, and that well, kind of thing? Well, I can give you a detail of the one going to New York, but I have trouble with this one. Okay. It seemed to me like it was an ordinary uh, Pullman type car as I remember. I am not absolutely sure about that, however. Uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll maybe pick up that kind of information a little later on with the uh, Camp Shanks trip. Mm -hmm. Let's get a, uh, what do you remember about your arrival in Camp Barkley? If you had, oh, yes. if, if we had uh, some way of transporting you back in time and placing you right there on Pershing Boulevard at the front gate, could you tell me what you would see there? Uh, 
the hills, mountains, a circle of mountains around it. That still lasts in my mind. Uh, a good distance away, several miles, uh, the f relatively flat country with uh, sand, you know, a lot of sand. And those barracks, they were a 12 men barracks, thin sheet of plywood, that's all, in a framework. And the wind blew through them almost unimpeded, it seemed like. What, what about the uh, division battery area? Uh, how was that set up? Uh, what kind of, where, where did the officers live? Where did you live? What about your well, vehicles well, and equipment? As I remember, most officers lived in the same type of accommodations, of course, in a different uh, uh, area. But there again, I don't remember too much about the BOQs because I never was around them. Uh, well, could you describe your living space, where the latrines were, how that was all set up, where you, where the mess hall oh, was? Uh, okay. In, in this 12-man building, we had cots, you know, just one, st one story cots. Uh, and they had uh, a, heating, a heating stove in each one. I believe there's two heating stoves actually each end. Uh, we had a, a mess hall that was fairly nicely built. It was a wooden building, but it was, you know, regular type, standard building construction. Like Fort Campbell? Yeah, Camp right, Campbell. kind of like that. Uh, as were our headquarters and office buildings. They were, uh, you might say, permanent or semi-permanent buildings. Uh, <clears throat> our uh, stay at Camp Barkley. Now, at that time, if you want me to talk about kind of kind of personal things for a mm -hmm. moment, uh, Vitaly and I, we uh, didn't like to go to Abilene because it was too crowded. There was something like three, two or three or f divisions or something like that at Camp Barkley. It was big. And this town of Abilene, which was at that time was about sixty or seventy thousand people, I think, was pretty small by comparison. And so there was GIs everywhere you looked. Nothing to do, nowhere to go, at least in our opinion. So when we left the camp, we went on down the Highway 80. That is how I met my wife. Tell in, us about that. In Cisco, Texas. Gene and I, one night, we were heading for Ranger. We heard Ranger was a place to go. So we were hitchhiking. We tried to get to Ranger, and Cisco was as far as we could get. We just couldn't get a ride because it was after midnight then, so we just found a hotel and stayed all night in a hotel. And in the morning, we got out on the street, and we asked somebody, well, what is there to do around this place? Or, you know, he told us about the, the lake area out there, and they had a skating rink and things like that. So, well, we decided we'd have a look at it, you know. We went out there, and sure enough, they had a skating rink. We got out there uh, early in the evening, and so we rented skates and skated. And I saw this young woman, and uh, it asked her to skate with me, and that's how I met her. Ellen Laverne Hayes, Ellen Laverne Hampton Hayes. After the war, we got married and lived together for 30 years before she died. Where we did, had two children. Where did you live? Did you, did you, In what? Texas. Uh, after I got out of the war, got out of the Army, I attended the University of Illinois for four semesters. And I thought I had money enough to finish, but I was very disillusioned. Things were too expensive for me, so I had to drop out. And I came to Texas. But I had married Laverne before I left Illinois, and she and I lived up there in a, in a room, in a rented room. And she got a job working for an architectural firm there, 
a pretty big one, one that designed the student un union building at Illinois University. Uh, and uh, anyway, we stayed there until I run out of money and she got pregnant. So then I decided I had to do something. I had to drop out of school and come to Texas. I sent Laverne on to Texas and I finished the semester and followed her. When I told my friends at Illinois that I was having to drop out of school and uh, they s protested and said, you shouldn't do that. Says, you, uh, they asked me where I was planning to go after I could come back and I said, I plan to start in at Texas Tech. And they says, oh, don't go to those southern schools, they're inferior. The reason we know they're inferior is because uh, the Caterpillar Company in Peoria hired a bunch of mechanical engineers from southern schools and they sent them all back to school. Of course, what they didn't realize is that that's what all companies that hire engineers do. They always send them to school for special training of some kind and that was standard practice then and it is now. <laughs> Uh, pretty largely practiced now. Um, but I, when I came and finally, after a year, I worked a year and finally got into Texas Tech, I found out what they were talking about for the inferiority of American school, for uh, Southern schools. At Illinois, I stayed, I was on the honor roll. When I came to Tech, I just merely missed probation by one semester hour, one semester. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to really struggle to get through. But uh, that is jumping ahead a little mm -hmm. bit. But it's, it's kind of background, I guess, for the way I think, maybe. <laughs> well, what about uh, this meeting with uh, your future wife? Did you meet the family at that point? Uh, did you uh, continue to go to Cisco a no, lot? No, I, I, I made a date with her, and I met the family. Uh, as about, mm, I see, it was about three or four days later, I think. What did they think about it? Laverne bringing home a soldier boy. Well, of course, I never heard him say anything, <laughs> especially a Yankee, because I was regarded as a Yankee then. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I, we went to Cisco every weekend to see her until we got shipped to New York. And we corresponded the whole time I was overseas. And uh, when we come back from overseas, we got married about a couple months, I think, after. Did, uh, did you all keep the letters, the correspondence from those years? No, we didn't, unfortunately. Uh, but it was quite an, uh, uh, quite an adventure in itself. But that would get me quite a good distance from the, the subject at hand, I suppose. Um, back to Camp Barkley, I guess, uh, and the training we got there was actually a continuation, more or less, of what we got at uh, Camp Camel. Any difference to it? Event more advanced. We took more advanced subjects and, and uh, delved more into the details of combat we had to learn. And in retrospect, I didn't think so at the time, but in retrospect, I'd say we got pretty good training. It was two solid years of almost constant training. And, and I'm sure that enables, enabled us to perform the way we did over there in, in Europe. What facilities on on base there, what facilities at Barclay uh, do you remember? Uh, the field house, uh, service clubs, those kinds of things. Yes, they had theaters. We had attended theaters and the, the day rooms and things like that were uh, pretty good. We didn't have any service clubs at that time uh, at Barclay that I know of. Uh, We had, uh, I felt that our army food was always good. There are many people who would differ with me on that, but uh, I always liked army chow. I thought it was pretty good. 
Do you remember anything about the uh, production that was put on there at Barclay called Hellcat Holiday? Yes, I saw that show, and it was a most remarkable production. You see, these were draftees, and they had all kinds of talent that they had drafted from places like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, and uh, we had all kinds of talent. And they really put on, and I still remember that as an outstanding show. And that show, I understand, went on the road briefly and actually performed at other camps. I thought it was an excellent entertainment. Do you remember any other like events, uh, rodeos and those kinds of things? No, I, I, I don't remember any of those. Uh, Let's see what comes next. I <laughs> well, if uh, you remember anything else about Barclay that you'd like to uh, add here before we get to the train trip to Shanks. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I say one, one thing about in the relationship of Barclay to Abilene. Uh, Abilene was a dry town at that time, but there were beer cans all over the street. In other words, it was a very wet, dry town, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> that impressed me for some reason. I don't know why. I looked at that, and to me, it looked bad. <laughs> you know, I thought that was pretty awful. <laughs> but here's a dry town. It's not supposed to have stuff like that. In it. But I can understand why. Some GIs weren't very well behaved. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. What about the criminal element? Did you encounter or do you remember anything about uh, uh, red light districts, no, uh, crime? No, I never got uh, involved with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, treatment of the soldiers by the, the townspeople? Uh, to, to what? The treatment of uh, soldiers by townspeople. Well, uh, they seem kind of cold to me. But I think that was my fault more than theirs, because I immediately decided to bypass the town, so to speak. So I never got real well acquainted with them. And, and I know they had stuff like YMCA and things that would entertain soldiers, but I never went to any of that stuff. So I cannot judge them at all, because, you know, I had no basis to judge them on, really. What about the uh, news that you're fixing to uh, uh, load up and take off for uh, New York? Well, it came as no surprise to us. We all felt it was about time. You know, that we'd been in training for two solid years. It's about time we did something. And I think a lot of people felt that way. I know I did. A lot of GIs that I know of. What we, kind of a what are we waiting for attitude. What do you remember about uh, the process of getting ready and loading? Well, uh, there's quite a bit of preparation. We, in the first place, we had to immerse all of our weapons in cosmoline. Had to physically immerse them in boiling cosmoline, and then pack them in uh, wax paper envelopes, and then box them and crate them. And that itself was quite a process. This is all of our small arms and stuff. The tanks and, and uh, mobile pieces and vehicles were taken care of otherwise, but there are small arms we had to pack up. And we did that. And that took, you know, like, seems to me like a couple of weeks or more, a good while, uh, to get all that sealed up. And it had to be sealed for seawater. Uh, and then and that long, rattly train ride, <laughs> Camp Shanks. Tell us about that train ride. What it do you was remember? fast. We made it in about, I'm trying to think of the time. I mean, our, our time from uh, Chicago to New York was just 18 hours. And so you couldn't have added much more than another 18 to it because we sidetracked trains everywhere we went. This troop train was coming through, man. They got everything, even these limited cars, off the track and sent us on our way. 
And I rode in a, a specially built troop car. It had bumps three tiers high, uh, three tiers of bumps. And the bottom bump during the daytime was left out to sit on and the others were folded up. And at night we folded the other two down and slept. I remember we stopped in Cleveland. We didn't stop in Chicago, I don't believe. Cleveland, I believe, was our first stop. I remember that. Uh, and like I say, I believe it was the fastest train ride I've ever been on. They must have put that train up nearly 100 miles an hour in some cases, in some stretches. Uh, and again, I don't remember a lot about our details at Camp Shanks. We didn't actually do much. We were just getting ready to board ship and go overseas, so there wasn't much to do there. We'd get off at about 4 or 4 o'clock and go to New York City. What did you do there? Entertained ourselves, you know, nightclubs, stuff like that, dances, things that we could go to there. And like I say, I attended, we went to the monkey bar frequently and the El Morocco several times, the Latin Quarter several times. Uh, what did you do on the train ride up, though? Do you remember? Not much, except write some letters that we could on the way and post them when we got there. The Cleveland stopover, how long was that? What oh, did that you was just a few minutes. We just got out and did calisthenics and got back on the train. We were on our way. Was that the only uh, time that happened? That you remember? Uh, that I, under, I believe we stopped at Chicago, but I'm not real sure. The one at Cleveland's the only one I distinctly remember. I think we made one more stop, and probably Chicago. Uh, uh, some such a place. What do you remember about uh, boarding ship, and uh, what, what can you tell me about the ship? Uh, we traveled over on the uh, it's an Army trans uh, a Navy transport ship. U.S. Grant was the name of it, and it was about 600 feet long and about 60 feet wide of beam, you know, and we carried about uh, 10 to 12,000 soldiers aboard, and this happened to be the command ship of the convoy, so we had all the high brass there, the general and the admiral and all that aboard our ship. Uh, we had about... Uh, 20-some ships in the convoy going over. I know we sighted a German sub once, and we slowed the convoy down, and the destroyers that were escorting us took out and, and shot them. I guess they hit them. They let loose some depth charges anyway. Could you see that? Oh, no. We, we, they were, see, they were way ahead of us. They, uh, they were like 10 or 15 miles ahead of us, looks like that. Uh, all we heard is a faint vibration of the depth charge. Uh, we uh, debarked at, uh, let's see, was it Hampton? Uh, what's that name in England? Uh, something like Hampton? Mm. On the southern coast of England? Well, that's, there's... Where There's we one marked. called Hamp Hampton, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, the whole convoy we put in there? Yeah, and we were stationed at a, a big field in England. Tidworth. Yeah, and uh, we spent about a month there, I think. And again, Vitaly and I did, did the rounds of <laughs> going to New York, I mean London, and uh, we were really fascinated by that underground train system in London. It, you didn't have to know anything about it. You'd go anywhere you wanted to. It was so easy. And that was the first time I ever saw a machine that would take bills and make change and give it to you. <laughs> I remember being impressed by that. Uh, and the trains were small cars, very quiet and very fast. I think they ran about 60 miles an hour, really fast, for the day. Uh, 
Uh, we went to uh, several places in London. The most amazing thing was when we were uh, about to board that LCI to cross over to Cherbourg, we, uh, Vitaly and I decided to blow all the money we had because we didn't know whether we'd get back or not. So we found a good restaurant in the, uh, near Piccadilly Circus, right? That's in one of the streets of Piccadilly Circus. And this was, I remember one thing about it, there was a, a show with the name Paramount on it, a, a theater across the street from this restaurant where we ate. I went upstairs, and to me, that was the most plush thing I'd ever seen up to that time. Had real thick carpets and real thick uh, uh, ropes, you know, to, for the aisles. The waiters were all in tuxedos, and they treated us like we were royalty. We ordered a pheasant dinner with appropriate wine and everything. And we ordered apple pie with actually whipped cream on it. The English had this nasty habit of putting a stacking high piles of mayonnaise on, on for apple pie and made it taste bad. Oh, goodness. I couldn't understand that. But this was actually whipped cream. And we thought it was very good. And I remember our bill was surprisingly cheap to us. We thought it was a pound ten. And we thought that was, you know, uh, a pound ten shillings. And we thought this was cheap for a meal so elegant. Did you succeed in spending all your money on no, that trip? No, we didn't. Uh, and then I, I found out, you know, that I could save money while I was in the Army just as well as not, so I, I did that. And while I was overseas, most of the time, I saved my money. I also took a correspondence course because I planned on entering college. This is my plan ever since I was 10 years old. I planned to enter college and study engineering. So I signed up for a couple of correspondence courses. And, uh, you know, just to see if I could get back to studying, which I took it successfully. Took a couple of math courses. And I remember we had a couple of Russian DPs that we had liberated from the Russian camps. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> one of them was a, a Ukrainian farmer, and his entire life was driving a tractor on a farm. But the other one was a, a school teacher, a former school teacher, and he was a major in the Soviet Army, and he was captured at Stalingrad. The only thing is, he wasn't supposed to surrender. Stalingrad, the order was given for the Russians not to surrender. And he was fearful when the war was over about going back to Russia. Uh, he couldn't speak English, but he was fluent in German. And we, I could manage to speak just enough German to communicate with him. And he helped me out one time on one of my problems. <laughs> And he showed me a shorter way to do it. You know whatever happened to him? No, I never heard. I've all, I wanted to find out. Uh, while we were overseas, uh, Gene, Gene Vitelli, he was a, a, a guy that was really persistent in everything he tried to do. When we got into France, he got a French manual and learned to speak French. When we got to contact with the Russians, he learned to speak Russian, and he could actually speak enough of it to communicate with them. I never could. I never could get anywhere with French or English, but I could understand German a little bit with them. And <clears throat> but one night, he, we went to a, a little house that some Russian displaced persons, a family of them, were staying. There was a, a, a middle-aged man and woman, and they had a couple of teenage children, a daughter about uh, maybe 16 and a boy about 18. And we went to visit them. And this lady served us vodka and rich buttered French bread with a whole lot of butter on it. <laughs> and I thought, 
I had drank three tumblers of that vodka, water glass size. And this Russian had brewed it down in the basement. He took us down and showed us this still. Down there's a crude thing. You know, a little brass pot with a copper tube coming out of it and running down this V trough with water running down the V trough and the thing curved up and down and dropped it in a jug, <laughs> condensed vodka. And he dumped some of it on the concrete floor and threw a match in it and it burned. So it had the proper alcohol content, I guess. Well, we were drinking that vodka, and I knew it was hard liquor, and I knew it, although I wasn't drunk at all, I just felt, you know, perfectly healthy. I knew that I couldn't drink any more of it and decided to quit. Uh, but those teenagers were drinking that stuff like it was water. It seemed to have no effect on them. The man and the woman, those son and daughter, they drink that stuff without restraint almost. And I saw it was about time for us to go home and go on guard, so I told Vitaly, we better get out of here. It's time for us to go on guard. So I got up and started for the door, and I didn't make it. I went off like that. <laughs> they had to guide me through the door. And I remember uh, having a bad time to get back to our billets, which was in Heidenheim, Germany, and it was several miles, uh, not several, probably two or three miles. Uh, and through winding streets. How we made it, I'll never know, but we did. And we come stumbling in our billets about the time the sergeant of the guard was coming after us. And at that time, I, I, I was so looped, I didn't know what I was doing, really, but I had sense enough to keep my mouth shut. Or I was afraid not to keep my mouth shut, I don't know which, whichever it was. Uh, Vitaly was a little bit louder with his, and, and he threw his hand up, says, I'm not drunk, and he fell over backwards and passed out. I remember that. <laughs> and this sergeant of the guard says, Hayes, you're okay, come on. <laughs> and I stumbled behind him, and I got to a jeep, and it was a patrol, a jeep patrol. I was to pull this four-hour guard duty on. And he put this Tommy gun in my hand. And I remember just freezing up, you know, I was scared out of my wits. I was afraid I would do something, hurt somebody. And I remember taking the bolt out of the Tommy gun, inspecting it very carefully, putting it back and locking it down, putting the clip under the seat <laughs> to make sure. And we drove all night, well, I'd say the remainder of the night, four hours, in that cold air, and I never sobered up. And it got so, I would, uh, the stationary guard post had fires built. And I would stagger up to the fire, and the guys would giggle at me, so I quit doing that. <laughs> I just sat in the jeep and waited. And when I got back, I got up in the morning, I felt great, just perfect. <laughs> and uh, no hangover, no nothing. But boy, I had this horrible thirst. Uh, and I was also hungry. And so I went to the mess hall. I got the mess hall. I took my first drink of water. And boy, was I ever looped again. <laughs> it took me two days to get over that, but I never touched vodka again until very recently. And uh, that was a, a, quite a loop. That, um, that, that all occurred after the war, then? Huh? That occurred all yeah, after the war? Yeah, that was after the at, war had ended. At right? We were still retained as a unit because we were scheduled to go to the Pacific War. Right. But we weren't training or anything. We were just pulling guard duty. At that time, we were, my division, my company, or battery, was uh, assigned to guard a German POW camp. Or, or is it barracks, actually. There's no Luftwaffe field that had really brick barracks, real fine barracks. And they had German families that had been scientists in Germany. And they were assigned to jobs in the United States. And Gene and I volunteered to do guard there because we could visit with those people. They were real intellectuals and very interesting, all of them. I, I still remember some of the people that I got acquainted with there. They made that kind of an impression on me. Uh, one electrical engineer who had lived 
in the United States and England before the war. He represented, uh, before the war, a German electronics manufacturing firm, uh, built x-rays, stuff like that, x-ray equipment. And he spoke American English. He and his wife both spoke American English. And he set out to teach us German the classic method. Unfortunately, we could only stay with him a couple of days because we were shipped out and deployed to other divisions. In other words, the war in, in, in Japan had ended and we, we were broke up as a division. But this guy could speak about six or seven different languages. He just had that talent. I met another old man that was a, a ph pharmacology professor at Jena and he was talking to me uh, excitedly about his research in uh, synthes trying to synthesize nerve tissue. And to me, as a young man, that really excited me, you know, to know that here's this old guy about 75 years old, was talking so excitedly about his research. And another guy, an MD that we met, he was at a club foot, I remember that. And, and Another guy who impressed me immensely was uh, Dr. Cook. He was a, an organic chemist. And he was forced to do research for the Nazis during the war on jet propulsion fuels. And one of the things that I remember most about him, he, we would set and uh, he would write a chemical formula. And I would give him the English name of it, and he'd give me the German name. And, of course, having had only high school chemistry, my memory was limited, but I could get most of the common compounds. And uh, he was very interesting. He said, you must have had a wonderful professor in your high school chemistry. <laughs> he said, uh, well, at that time I was interested in those kind of things. And I could remember it. Uh, but those people all had a profound influence on me when I came back later enrolled in college. I never heard from any of them since. I don't know what happened to them. And were all of these DPs at Heidenheim? Yes, at Heidenheim. Uh -huh. Well, let's back up a little bit and uh, get the division across the channel into France. What do you remember about that trip? Well, I remember one thing. They gave us uh, seasick pills to cross that channel, and we'd never had a seen a seasick pill before. But they decided it was so rough, and I decided that I would abstain from taking it unless I got in trouble, which of course was not logical, but that's my thinking at the time. Uh, so I didn't take the pill, but the sea was plenty choppy going across as an LST. And we uh, offloaded the LST and went down the ramp and in the water uh, up the coast of Cherbourg. Now, you've got to remember the Germans were but way back on this side of the Rhine at that time. They hadn't crossed the Rhine yet, but they had been driven mainly out of France, most of France. Uh, we uh, went up, uh, stayed on mostly country roads in uh, France, and we spent uh, Thanksgiving Day uh, in, in France. I remember we had a, a big turkey dinner and I volunteered for KP so I'd get enough to eat. Gosh, I didn't need to do that because <laughs> we had nothing but food that day. They really f served us a fancy meal at uh, Thanksgiving. And then we moved on and went into uh, Stras Strasbourg. We went into Strasbourg, we were driven out and then back again. I remember one time when we were driven back out of Strasbourg and we were sleeping in pup tents in an open field and it snowed on us that night and these people, most of them didn't bring their clothes in or anything, just threw them down with bed and they got a bed to dig out of the snow. <laughs> there were a lot of cousins about that. What, uh, what's your memory of the first combat action? Uh, 
course, that would have been December. I'm trying to place the very first. The very first is when we replaced the 4th Armored Division at the Battle of the Bulge. And we were just closing up the Battle of the Bulge at that time. And I went up, we went up to this front. And my impression was a bunch of dead GIs and Germans by the thousands. The, the uh, ambulances haven't, hadn't removed any of them yet. And they were dead all over the place. Uh, that made quite an impression on me. Uh, we started in rather quickly, right away. And from then on, I was glued to that radio. Uh, all but a, a few exceptions when I could get free. Uh, when we were back behind, when we wanted to change fronts, we'd go about 10 miles behind the lines and then pull up again. And I think maybe this had something to do with our name. Our name tag is the Mystery Division because we were appearing here and appearing there without notice, those kind of things. Uh, because we would go behind the lines and we'd clean up our radios and our equipment, our weapons and everything, and go be fixed to hit them at another point. Uh, Do you remember any special uh, procedures, uh, radio procedures you were given in terms of uh, combat? Uh, oh, we operated according to a, a so-called SOI, Signal Operating Instructions. And that SOI was operated, was issued every day. Mm -hmm. And this gave us the codes that we used and the, the things that we would uh, have to do to keep our, our radio secret. Now, our fire commands, of course, were in clear text. You didn't dare send them in code because if they were encoded, the Germans knew what was happening, then they would give them a key to decode it. So they were always in clear text. But our uh, tactical messages were in, in Morse code. They were generally sent by the key on, on the AM radio. In fact, I mean to say they were always sent by the AM radio key. And there again, we had a, a code for every day. And this little so-called M1 encoder decoder would do the encoding and decoding for us in accordance to a code of setting pinwheels on. And, it, you know, it was supposedly an unbreakable code. And it must have been, because I never heard of any, uh, thing, any case of anybody ever breaking it. The, the code was, had uh, oh, five, about five wheels that you had to set up on a certain number. And each of those numbers denoted a code for encoding the letters that you typed into it. Uh, it was quite an amazing device, I thought. And this is the main, our main thing that we went by there, is using that code to send tactical messages. And we would always have to authenticate our calls. Uh, one time I had this German operator operating on our of trying to break into our network. And he kept at me. And so I finally said, go ahead, send, send your message. And he sent a, a short, uh, a full intermediate type length message, and I copied it. I turned it over to G2. And after that, he shut up and never bothered me anymore. <laughs> uh, we had the thing about us as operators. We had five operators in this network, one for each battalion, one for the division, and one for the division artillery headquarters. And we knew each other's touch. Nobody could fool us on that, because every uh, manual Morris key operator has a distinct sound that's his own. And when a guy was calling me up, I knew which one it was. It was uh, uh, the 493rd or 494th or division or what. I knew from the operator's touch. Sort and of a style? 
Yes. Uh, the the yeah, way the they... style of sending the code. And uh, all the operators soon got acquainted with that, but we had been operating together for the better part of two years. Actually, the, almost three years then, toward the end of the war. So we knew each other pretty well. I know we had Kowalski in, in uh, uh, 495th. I've forgotten the name of some of the others now. But I remember Kowalski because he had a very distinct touch and he was very fast. He was a very good operator. <laughs> what about Hurlsheim? What do you remember about that? At Hurlsheim, uh, Major Givens woke me up in the middle of the night and told me to get out of bed and get the radio network open. And I saw the urgency in his face. I didn't bother to ask him why or what. I did it. And of course, when I got the radio on that open and the, the message started coming, I found out that we had trapped men in Hurlsheim. I understood from the messages that there were two battalions lost there. I know that Major Gibbons flew a mission that night. I held the flashlight for him at one end of the runway, which was not a runway, just a grass field, and it was pitch dark. I held this uh, uh, camouflage type flashlight. We had a man at each end to mark the ends of the runway, and he took off with a makeshift parachute and a, a box of medical supplies to dump on these guys. And we never know whether he actually accomplished it or not. He doesn't know either, I don't guess. But he at least tried. And uh, that battle lasted for two or three days, as I remember. I know that we called up, we had nobody in front of us. We called up all of our three battalions of artillery, and we called up three core artillery battalions of 155s, and we pounded that thing with shells all night as fast as you could fire a gun continuously, which is about maybe one round every minute, something like that, for each gun. Into Hurlsheim? Yes. And when they got through, all buildings were broken up and the bricks were broken. And we didn't find our GIs. We found lots of dead Germans and dead dogs and cats and stuff like that. But we didn't find any of our people. At least I, I wasn't aware of it if we did. I didn't see any of them. And I wondered about what happened to those guys. There was two battalions, a battalion of infantry and a battalion of tanks that were captured at Hurlsheim. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, when daylight came, we called the 12th Tactical Air Force in with 500 pounders. and let them have it, 500 pounders, for the rest of the day, or most of the rest of the day. So the Germans uh, got the captured Americans out of there quickly. So they were not in harm's way when you were laying in all this artillery into Hurlsheim? Well, we didn't know that one way or another. I'm afraid that's a kind of a thing that you sometimes have to face. You know, or I, what, what do you do? You can't just back off and let them come in. You have to stop them. Now, is this uh, about the time that uh, you heard uh, or saw Maurice Glover's crash, or did that happen later? Uh, no, that was uh, that happened before that. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, well, uh, Maurice and uh, Herman Nast were flying patrol. It was about midday, I think. I'm not real sure about that time, but I know it was bright light, sunlight. It was midday, about midday. Uh, a thirty, uh, about a forty, forty millimeter, I guess. I mean, a twenty millimeter, twenty millimeter shell came through the airplane on the side, left side like this, and it hit Herman's wristwatch and set it off, and it blew up right here in his lap, and it tore part of his jaw off, the hole in his side quite a bit off his leg. 
And I must say, the dentist that operated on him did a remarkable job. I still think that dentist deserved a, an award for doing that, saving his life. I remember when Morris brought the plane in, and we knew, of course, by the radio that we, that we had injured, he'd been hit. And uh, Morris brought the plane in, and I remember that me and about five others gathering around that plane to get him out of it. And it was difficult because it was hurt badly, and we couldn't move his bones around too much, you know, because of the uh, extensive injuries on him. And we carried him into the tent uh, and put him on a stretcher in the tent. There's about five, four or five of us carrying him in there. And uh, this dentist started working on him, and a guy was holding the plasma bottle, and he fainted. And so I was told to hold, if I could hold the plasma bottle, I said, I'll try it. And so I held the plasma bottle for, up for the rest of the operation. And the thing that impressed me was, is how pale this guy looked. He didn't look like himself. And of course, I hadn't seen anything like that myself. Boy, now that kind of shook me up. <laughs> uh, he was really uh, torn up. But that's the main thing. I'll never forget how pale he looked. He was trembling, you know, trembling visibly. What about Maurice? Uh -huh. What about Maurice while all this is happening? Well, was, I was... don't remember what. I really don't. I don't remember. Of course, I was concentrating on helping get him out. I don't remember whether Maurice was in the crowd helping unload him. That might have been the case. I don't know. I don't even remember who the guys were. Maurice probably were, but was because we didn't have that many people around this airfield at that time. Uh, but I mean, this to me that shock of seeing Nast in severe shock really kind of blocked me out of a lot of things. I saw him pale and trembling, you know, it was really awful to me. Could you describe uh, the sight when you approached the aircraft? What did the, could you describe what the aircraft looked like? Well, by that time, I, I come up last, or near last. Two or three guys had got there and got the thing open. You know, those things had a flap that you opened up, pinned up under a wing, and the bottom flap flopped down. And that exposed the two seats, and you could lift them out through that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that uh, that was open by the time I got there behind him and hel helping him to pull him, his leg out, get him up. Any damage visible? Huh? Any damage to the aircraft visible? I don't remember that. There had to be a lot of it, but I didn't see it because I was thinking about NAST. I wasn't even looking at the airplane for some reason. There had to be uh, some very considerable damage. You blow off a 20 millimeter shell inside of a light aircraft, it'll in most cases take it out of the air. It should have been very severely damaged, but I didn't even see it because of that. Uh, Maurice has given the collection a pair of spectacles that Nask was wearing that day when he was shot down. Oh. We have that in the collection at Abilene. That's one of the reasons why we're interested in this particular rescue. And well, anyway, we walked to a tent and, you know, had a light uh, hanging up on the inside of a, a, a six-volt a six uh, vehicle light hanging up, and that's what that dentist used to operate on him and patch him up best he could. And of course, he was sent to the Army Hospital after that. I never heard from him again until a couple of years ago. I met him, and we got our pictures taken together. He seems to be totally recovered from it. Any other uh, experiences on the combat trail for you that, you, that stand out? Uh, one was uh, at Bischweiler, France. So this was before Hurlsheim. Uh, we got shelled by the uh, Nazi uh, 170 millimeter howitzers. They were dropping. This was in a, a building in a courtyard. 
the vehicles were parked in the courtyard. And we had sense enough by that time to have remotes for our radio. So I had a remote cable for the radio in, inside the building and down on a table in front of this window, basement window. And we could operate the radios from that. Uh, and the shells were really doing some damage out there. And I remember we had one particular operator. He was a good radio operator, a former truck driver in civilian life. He has turned out to be actually an outstanding radio operator. Uh, but that night, for some reason, he wanted to go out there when I had my cable taken out. Uh, a piece of shrapnel or something caught it, just took it right out the window. And he was determined to go out there and operate that radio. I remember I had to get in front of the door and spread eagle myself in front of the door to keep him going out there. And, you know, that made us wonder for a little while about Herman. <laughs> Why he, I know why he was so intent on going out and operating that radio. Uh, the, the guys there, you know, pleaded with him and all, and tried to get him to change his mind. But uh, to me, that was unusual. Uh, another time, this was after the war had almost ended. They hadn't called a ceasefire yet, but they had ended their war, uh, essentially. And we had a mechanic by the name of Hattery. This guy was a, a better mechanic when he was drunk than he was when he was sober. He was the same thing I ever saw. He was a wizard with his hands as a mechanic. But he decided he was, he got boozed up a little bit and he decided he was going to go hunt some crowds. And he got this Tommy gun on his shoulder, you know, and strapped and clip in it and he was fixing to go out there. And, and the guy said, oh, let him go. What the heck? There's nobody out there at this time of day. And so he was gone pretty soon and heard that clip him on that gun. <laughs> and we didn't think anything about it. He's probably shooting at trees or something. He was lit up. Well, he comes marching a bunch of crowds back. There's about 10 of them. Goose stepping in his perfect formation. And they were sure be drago looking though. And there was Harry staggering back and forth behind him with that empty gun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he decided he was going to uh, uh, question them. And he'd stagger up to one of them and he'd stagger back. And those crowds were laughing, you know, but they couldn't hardly hold themselves. They were trying not to laugh because they didn't want to make him mad. <laughs> and they were trying. And he was staggering up to them. And finally, they just took him back to the POW. These were Wehrmacht. They weren't the kind of people that gave us trouble. Uh, so they went back to a, a regular POW camp, and they got a bath and clean clothes and everything. The SS was another matter. When we captured the SS, we treated them differently. Why so? Because of their nature. They were animals. I was, when I was in high school, I heard all this Nazi propaganda. I didn't believe a word of it. I said, that's just propaganda. I didn't believe it. I said, people don't do stuff like that. But I found out they did. And, uh, we, we tried to, we caught one of those guys and we tried to get them to run so we'd kill, shoot them. And they were, they were too smart to do that. But they were, they were just totally defiant right to the end. Hmm. And uh, another instance about Nazi propaganda. I heard about this business of Jew, exterminating Jews. Uh, over there. And I didn't believe that either until I saw this branch camp of Dachau. That Landsberg? I believe that was. I believe that was the place. It wasn't the main camp, but it was a, a branch of Dachau. And uh, the pictures were pretty gruesome. I didn't actually witness this firsthand, but the guys that did that came up on it saw it and took photographs immediately. And I saw the photographs that they made right there. Uh, 
they had freed what prisoners that could walk, of course. And I heard some pretty wild stories too. They turned those Germans loose on the, uh, these guys that, had that they had mistreated and let them beat them up. We had one Russian, uh, uh, George, who was pretty bad at that too. They'd just turn old George loose on them if they wanted to interrogate a guy. <laughs> he was a big man, a big Russian guy. But Why was he with you? This. Like I say, can you believe anybody being that naive, how naive I was? But what was I to believe? I, all I got was radio reports and mm -hmm. newspaper reports in the United States. And I'd heard about propaganda. And I decided we were just as capable of it as anybody else. And I figured that's what it was. But it wasn't. It was real. They did not only exterminate something like six million Jews, they exterminated about seven million other people, non-Jews, in those same camps. And I had a co-worker, a German, that laid all night in the mud to escape a, a, a prison camp in East Germany. His parents were executed by these people during the war. And Dieter was like uh, 12 years old then. And he slept in this mud puddle all night until he could get out at night and get back to the, the uh, west side of Berlin and eventually came to the United States. And he ended up going to the University of Maryland. And I knew him as a, a field engineer where I worked. Hmm. So the people do these things. Also, I worked for a, a Cuban named Gene Farrakh, who was there when Castro took over. He was 10 years old at the time, and his parents were executed by the communists in Cuba. And Gene was sent to Madrid, and he lived as a street urchin in Madrid until he was early, late teens. And he got passage to the United States. And he went to the University of Florida, uh, no, Florida State, and got a degree in civil engineering. Uh, those, of course, were much many, many years later. But it gives you some idea that these people are very real. Do you remember anything about the town of Landsberg? No, I don't. I, I, I missed most of the town itself. I, I, I wasn't, you know, we just went by there in my particular mm -hmm. unit. Anything else about the uh, combat phase that you would like to add uh, leading up to uh, VE Day? Well, of course, one night we were in a firefight with somebody and the uh, fire direction plotter got sick and I was called upon to plot the rounds in, in the fire control tent and that was you know in the middle of the night like midnight and we sustained quite a bit of fire there on that and it was my first real experience of being a plotter what I was trained for but I was later took radio training and I was a radio operator but I was pulled off the radio for this short time uh, that's about the only thing. The, the, the Bischweiler, back to that Bischweiler campaign, we had a, a, an operations corporal that took gunnery with my class in school. And the Germans were coming in. We were getting small arms fire on our CP. And he took a phone, a telephone, field telephone, and a roll of telephone wire pass it into the switchboard and he ran up the four steps and got on top of the roof of the building and called in three battalions and fired them on that unit on those Germans that were coming in. He stopped them. Uh, about that time Colonel Gildart, he was a slate and he come in there scratching his eyes and wanted to know what was going on and they told him and he grabbed up the phone you know and, and he uh, started relaying the fire commands. For, uh, 
the thing that struck me about it, he didn't bother to authenticate that call where that FO was located. It could have been a German firing on us. <laughs> but he was too excited, I guess, to even question what was happening. Of course, they told him who it was. This guy, I can't remember his name now. This operations corporal that already went up there and was uh, being the FO for this. Were you able to keep any uh, materials from World War II? Did you uh, bring back any uh, captured souvenirs, souvenirs no. or documents no. or anything like that? It's amazing. I could have had anything that I wanted. I could have had access to Lugers, P-38 pistols, stuff like that. Any kind of a camera I wanted. But I didn't want them. And I don't know why, but I didn't want them. I didn't even want to take that stuff home with me. And later, out here while hunting with a rifle and a shotgun, I was dead eye. I could hit birds on the fly every other shell with a shotgun, 50%. But I've never owned a gun. I'm somehow afraid of them. And I don't, I really don't know why, but I'm just that much afraid of guns. <laughs> I don't like to be around them. Yet I fired plenty of them. I, one of the things I had to fire a lot of uh, rounds at was the uh, Falk Wolf jets that come over and keep them up there on 50 caliber. I had to fire a lot of those. And uh, we had one guy actually drop the hand grenade on us. <laughs> He must have been a pretty terrific thrower to throw a hand grenade out of an airplane at maybe 5,000 feet and hit it. My goodness. That's what he managed to do. Well, it didn't do any damage, just a little hand grenade that didn't quite hit the target, but it was close to us. What happened to June Vitale? Well, I, he lives now in uh, Rodondo Beach, California. In fact, I owe him a letter. We're keeping up with him. What did he do after the war? Uh, he was an industrial planner for an aircraft company. And in other words, his work subsequently paralleled mine quite a bit. He sent me some of his work, and I, I noticed what he was. I recognized what he was doing. Uh, my work was been a little different. I, I worked for three different companies after the war. Uh, Collins Radio. Uh, Texas Electric Service Company and General Dynamics in Fort Worth. And I was sort of a engineering type troubleshooter. In other words, I would try to work the far out problems. To give one example, which is a, an example of many of the types of projects that I did at all three companies, was that uh, General Dynamics had a pla plating problem. Uh, hard chrome plating, chromium on uh, landing gear pins. There were a little pin about that big around, about that long with an offset and thing. And one end of it was to be plated with hard chromium. In other words, it was not a non-lubricated bearing. And on the F-111, every one of those failed. And we tried everywhere to get somebody to take the contract and do it. And none of them would do it. We even talked to the Lane Electroplaters here in Dallas that had been in the business since 1927. And they had hard chrome plated diesel engine crankshafts. Yet they wouldn't do this. Uh, this thing was made of D6 steel. And uh, what I had come up with an idea one morning I was talking about to my department head about another subject, and he just popped the question out of the air. He says, uh, what do you know about chrome plating? I said, absolutely nothing. And he said, well, how would you go about plating a uniform coat on, on a, an irregular object? I said, I would uh, find the field, uh, the, the surface of equal potential and make that electrode that shape, and this should give you a constant current density throughout the system. He says, you're assigned to the job. <laughs> and 
he called that night and called up the uh, uh, test lab and had a chemist assigned to me to do the chemical work part of it. And I did the analysis on that, the mathematical, and everything. We did the experiments, measuring the dynamic conductivity of the solution. And we ran a, a project in the test lab. We made a pilot model and ran that. And then we made a real model to work out in the plant. All of that was, you know, classic textbook procedure. It worked perfectly. Company made millions of dollars, or saved millions of dollars on it. And uh, like I say, that was a type of projects that I did. Now Gene's uh, work was more uh, clerical in, in the sense that he made layouts, and tooling layouts and stuff like that, which is also a vital part of the industrial engineering part of a company of this size. I had one other question as sort of a follow-up. Uh, you mentioned the German POW camp that you were guarding, and I'm not sure if it was in Heidenheim or some other place uh, there towards the end of the Heidenheim, war. Heidenheim, yeah. Uh, do you tell me a little bit about who was in that and how that was set up? Well, the Germans pretty much had their free run. They could come and go as they pleased. What we were doing that for is to keep the Polacks and the French out, mainly so that they couldn't get in and harm these guys or kidnap them or whatever. And so anyway, Gene and I were sitting there almost asleep. We weren't quite asleep, but we were almost asleep. And one of the Germans come by and said in English, this is a strange guard, I think. <laughs> but anyway, we <laughs> mostly visited with them. We drank beer. They always had beer on tap. We drank beer. And discuss mostly intellectual subjects with them. But a lot of general subjects too, but mostly intellectual. Because I felt that this was my ground to prepare for study of engineering later. This was after the war's over? Yes. And mm -hmm. so these are basically DPs or were these military well, prisoners? Well, they were classified as DPs, but they were mostly civilians. Oh, well, they were. Perhaps all of them were civilians. Hmm. Uh, You said, you mentioned something uh, a while ago about, when I asked you about the letters of correspondence with your wife, uh, that, that, that there was a story to be told about that. What did you mean by that? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, when I first met her, Jean was with me, Jean Vitelli. And we met these two girls. And... Uh, we, uh, of course, took a while to get acquainted, and we went and made a couple of tri trips back, uh, several trips back to see them. Uh, Laverne and I had, I guess, had sort of grown on each other, and uh, we decided that we wanted to keep in touch, so we, we did keep up correspondence throughout the war. Uh, Jean, I, I, I don't think he kept up with the girl that he visited, but I met her since, and she was married to some other guy here. In, she lived in Texarkana, the last I heard. But uh, uh, I think that was that the question you had. Mm -hmm. That anyway, she wrote, you know, frequently. I had two correspondents. I had a, a, a half sister who now lives in California. Uh, she wrote to me throughout the war. I, have to, I hadn't heard from her. I'd last seen her in 1930. But when I got in the Army, she uh, just sent me this letter out of the clear blue. And it was Virginia, my youngest half-sister. Uh, she is about six years older than me. Uh, and she, faithfully, every week I got a letter from her. And it was, you know, about things happening in the U.S. at the time. And the day I got out of the Army, I never heard from her again. 
uh, we went to, uh, Cal made a trip to California, Betty and I, and we looked her up, found her. And we're back in touch again. But there was a considerable lapse there. <laughs> what about correspondence that you sent to her? Did she keep it? Are you aware of that? I don't think so. I, I know I didn't keep any. Again, I realized belatedly that you're supposed to keep stuff like that. I didn't. I what about Laverne? Why. And Laverne, never, Laverne did not either? No. Uh, Laverne died of a heart attack in her sleep uh, five years ago. Six, well, six years now. Seven years. 1988. Yeah, six years. And, did, you, uh, did you have any children? Huh? Did you have any children? Yeah, we had two daughters. I have a daughter living in... Uh, Denver and one living in Denton. Here. What are what are their names? Huh? What are their names? Uh, Jeannie is the oldest one. Cindy is the youngest one. Neither has a middle name. Well, can you think of anything else you'd like to maybe add to uh, this interview that we haven't covered that you wanted to get on the record? Well, like I say, it was a long, long time ago. And these things that I've talked about had to impress me very much or I wouldn't have remembered it. Because think of my attitude at the time. I wanted to get it over with. I knew I owed my country a debt. And I wanted to pay it back as fast as I could and get back on about my business. I didn't want anything to do with the Army after it was over. And I refused to join the reserves or anything. Uh, after about five years, however, I began to wonder what happened to the Hellcats. I'd never heard of hiding our hair of them. And, and I started looking out for papers and periodicals and stuff where I could see something mentioned to them, and I never heard of it. Until one day in the Dallas News, Dallas Morning News, Betty saw an article and says, well, you're out to fit the 12th Army. I said, yeah, what about it? And she told me, showed me this article, and it gave a number to call. And I called him up, and that's how I got in touch with Maurice. And so when was that? Uh, recently? Uh, that was, yeah, about uh, three years ago now, I guess. So until three years ago, you didn't know of the existence? No, I didn't know. What how, I didn't even know they had a, an association until about three years ago. Well, and it's, you know, it's a shame, but that's, that's a... a an error on my part by not keeping in touch or trying to. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Yes, sir.